Hi there, I'm Coach Todd, head coach of No Limits Triathlon.com, and thank you for joining me on this webinar today. And so thanks also for sending me some questions, and I'm starting to go through some of the questions that you have. And this is just a, just a kind of a way to answer some of your questions and help you get going with your triathlon uh, that's, that's upcoming. So for me, uh, today is, uh, I'm doing this a bit early. Today is April 23rd, it's on a Wednesday. And I leave this weekend for a training camp, uh, Wildflower. Now I did, uh, I did this training camp years ago. And it was one of my first times I ever traveled by myself. First time I ever had to pack up my bike. And uh, I was pretty nervous and scared. So now I'm, we're traveling down with a group to do the race. And it's, it's going to be pretty fantastic. But kind of what I do is I've just been reflecting on how far I've come in the sport. And it's quite crazy. But what I want to do is kind of go back to the beginning and help you answer uh, some of the questions that you may have. I know that when you first get into triathlon, there's, there's so many questions that you might have. And so we're just going to do a couple of questions now. And if you find the, I didn't answer your question, but you have more questions, just send me an email. I'm happy to uh, send you a response. So the first one is, is you know, hi Todd, I, can, I want to do a triathlon. I know I can swim, I know I can bike, I know I can run, but how do I put it all together? And so really what, you know, what I do, I suggest for a lot of people is, what you need to do is look at the calendar. So pull out your week schedule. And you want to try and get in at least two, two workouts in each event. And you can spread them out. So typically, just to make this super simple, you could swim on a Monday, you could bike on a Tuesday, and then you can run on a, a a Wednesday and then do it all again on Thursday, Friday, Saturday. So swim, bike, run. And then when you come to Sunday, you can take it off. So that's, that's a super easy way to do it. If you want to do more workouts, say if you want to do three swims, three bikes, three runs, you could totally do that as well. But then what's going to happen is you're going to be, you're going to be doubling up. So you're going to be doing two workouts in a day, which is totally fine too. So I usually set, suggest if you want to do, go that route, if you want to do two in a day, I suggest doing one in the morning and then one at lunch or one in the evening so you can spread them out. Or if you find that you don't have that flexibility in your schedule, the other thing you could do is you could do two short ones. So you could do a short swim followed by a short bike, or you could sh do a short bike followed by a short run. On the other hand, what I like to see people do too is say if you're going out for a long run, so going out for a long bike ride, and then when you come back to your car, put your bike in the car, then pull out your running shoes. And even if you run for five or 10 minutes, that's a great way to get your body used to feeling that tired rubbery legs, that tired rubbery leg feeling after getting off the bike. So if, you, if you've done a lot of biking, chances are you haven't run right away. So that's a new feeling for you. So I do suggest you going out and trying to do a bike and then running right after it because it kind of feels a little bit different. I remember when I did my first race, I'm like, whoa, this feels really weird. But the more times you do it, uh, the easier it's going to get. So that type of a workout is called a, a brick workout. And so what you're doing is you're putting two workouts back to back. So it could either be, you know, you could do it swim, bike, or bike, run, or you could do a run, bike, or a run, swim. Typically, I suggest, though, try to keep it in the correct order of a triathlon. So the order of a triathlon goes swim, bike, run. So I always try to think if you're going to swim, follow it up with a bike. If you're going to bike, then follow it up with a run. So that's kind of the easy way or a simple answer how to get your training uh, planned for the week is keep it simple. Go swim, bike, run, swim, bike, run, and then take a day off. It's easy to get carried away with this activity and you find that you want to do more and more and more because it's it feels, it feels so good and sometimes you think that the more you do, the better you're going to get and that's not necessarily the case. Sometimes you definitely need to take a, a day off. So I suggest to all my athletes that they pick a day during the week that they don't do any activity or if they're going to do some activity, make it very, very easy. Okay, so that's, that's question number one. Uh, question number two, how much should I do? So how much swimming should I do? How much biking should I do? How much running should I do? Uh, that kind of comes down to what's the distance of the race you're going to do. So if you're doing a sprint distance race, basically the swim can range from a 500 to a 750 swim. So what you need to do is you need to be able to make sure, first of all, that you can be in a pool and you can swim that distance. 
So depending on how fast of a swimmer you are, you might uh, be able to get done, you know, 500 to 750, you know, in, you know, maybe 8 or 12 minutes. But if you're a slower swimmer, it can almost double that time. So you need to get to the pool. You need to make sure that you can swim the distance. So if it's a 500 or 750, make sure you can go in and then do it. You don't have to do it continuously at first. My, my very first year doing triathlons, I would do a sprint triathlon and the distance was 800 meter swim. So what I did is I broke it up into two 400s. Seriously, the workout, my, my training back then was, was so simple, it was crazy. What I would do is I would hop in the pool, I would swim for 400 meters, take a minute break, then do another 400 meters, and then I was done. And I would get the time for the first 400, time for the second 400, see I was getting faster. And then eventually what I did is I put it all together so that I knew that on race day that I could do it. And that's the biggest thing with uh, this whole thing is you need to be confident to know that, you know what, I can do this. So if you can break them down individually, so if you break down the swim and you get through that distance training by yourself, then you're going to know that you can be able to do it in the triathlon as well. So with the bike, uh, oh, let's go back a bit. So say that's the sprint. If you're doing an Olympic swim, again, I think you should uh, build up to the 1500 and give yourself a 1500 test and see if you can do the 1500. So if you could do a 1500 continuous, then you're ready for the race. Same thing with, once you get up to the half Ironman or the Ironman distance, I rarely get people doing uh, 2000 at a time. And if I'm gonna get them doing 2000 meters at a time, I'll give them a specific workout so it kind of breaks up the monotony. For me, I, I can't swim 4K continuously, which is, it would drive me crazy. I need to have something broken up so I have a specific workouts. And you can find that too, you can just do, you can break it up into hundreds, two hundreds, four hundreds, five hundreds. You could do a pyramid workout, so you're building as you go uh, up to the top and then you come down so that makes it easier. There's lots of different ways that you can chunk up the workout or chunk down the workout to make it enjoyable and make it easier to do. Now let's go to the bike. Say if your bike is um, in sprint distance, so say 20k. So you need to know that you can go out and you can bike 20k. And if you feel like you're totally exhausted after 20k, then maybe you need to do a little bit more training for the triathlon. Because remember, you still have to run. Uh, when you're doing uh, Olympic distance, you have to bike for 40k. So again, you should be able to bike 40k in training so that you can do it in the race. Now again, when you bump up to the half Ironman distance, you're at the 90K, and I suggest that you should be able to bike close to that distance. You don't have to bike uh, exactly 90, but as long as you can get you know about 75 or 80% of it done, then that's good. Now what I mean by that is, not because you're getting exhausted 75 to 8%, but because of time constraints. There's many times when I'm training, I just can't get the full distance in because of weather or family commitments or job commitments, but I don't beat myself up. I, when I finish the workout, I go, okay, so this is how I feel after doing this amount. Do you think I could continue on for the, the remainder of the distance? And if I can't, then I need more, more training to do. For example, when I do an Ironman, I do an Ironman every year, but when I'm doing my Ironman bike training, the distance of the bike is 180 kilometers. And I've, I'm not sure if I've ever biked 180 kilometers outside of an Ironman. I think the closest I usually get is 165. And that's, that's usually good enough for me. I go, if I can get to 165 or 160, I know I can do the last 20K. Okay, so I hope that helps with uh, knowing how much you should do. Um, for the sprints, you should be able to do uh, the distances individually, the Olympic distance, you should be able to do those distances individually as well. So you should be able to run 10K, you should be able to bike 40, and you should be able to swim 1500 continuous. But then once you move up to the half Ironman, again, you don't need to do a run a full 21 kilometers, you don't need to bike 90, but you should be able to, you should be able to get about, you know, 80% of that done in training. So if you can do that, then you'll be good to go. And remember, if your goal is to win the race, then you're gonna to have to do more training. If your goal is to complete the race and get the t-shirt and the medal, then you don't, do, you don't need to do as much because you're not gonna be going as hard. All right, so another question I got here is, how does a transition work and what is a transition? So in triathlons, you start off by swimming and then you need a bike and then you need to run. And so in between there, there's two transitions. So there's a transition between the swim and the bike. That's called 
transition one or T1, and the second transition is from the bike to the run, and that's often known as T2. So how does that work? So first of all, when you get to the race on race day, most transitions are in a parking lot. So they clear out, you know, cars can't go in there, and they'll have spaces and bike racks everywhere, and you need to put your bike in the designated spot. Some races have designated spots, they'll give you a number, say if your number is 49, you can take your bike, find 49 in the bike rack, and then you put it there. So then what you need to do is you need to get all your stuff out. You need to get your bike ready to race, and then you need to get your body ready to race. So that means, okay, the first thing you need to do is swim. So I need to make sure I have my swim trunks on, and if it's a wetsuit race, then you need to put on your wetsuit, you need to put on a swim cap, you need to put on your goggles, and I like to race with the watch, so I need to make sure I have my watch on. Most races as well require you to have a timing chip. A timing chip usually goes around your, goes around your ankle, and then what it does is so that it's like a, is a magnet, magnetic chip, maybe, so that when you're running across a timing mat, what it does is it registers your chip, and it tells, it can just measure your time. So at the end of the race, you have all your running, you have all these splits, of, of the whole race. So you have your swim split, you might even have your transition splits, your bike split, and your run split, and then your overall time. Because you may not think that time doesn't matter, but as you get more into the sport, it's kind of neat to see how you're doing and if this is getting better. Sorry. <laughs> From this, where I'm sitting here, I didn't think this was recording. I'm like, oh my gosh, I cannot believe I didn't press record button, but we're okay, we're good. Sorry I got distracted there. Okay, so back to transitions. All right. Um, so when you bring your bike and you rack it up, what you need to do is you need to get your bike ready to go. And what I'm gonna do, my bike is right over here. I'm gonna uh, roll it over here. I'm gonna show you kind of the checklist that I do. But I do, I, I bring a checklist with me every time I, I go to do a triathlon. And it doesn't matter where I race. So if I'm racing in Europe or Australia or, or Hawaii, I bring the same checklist. I'll modify it a bit. I'll modify it if it's if it's an ocean swim, or if it's a lake swim, if it's a non-wetsuit swim or a pool swim, I'll change a bit. But the majority of this is always going to be the same. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna, and I'll have this, I can put this below for you guys to download in a PDF format. Um, so let's start with the swim. The first thing I I do is make sure I have my swimsuit and my singlet on. A singlet, so a swimsuit, you know, I just have bottoms on. And a singlet is like, it's like it's a race top. And sometimes I'll have it on, sometimes I won't. If I have a, a wetsuit race, then I'll put the singlet on and I'll be underneath my wetsuit. So that's the first thing I do, make sure I have my swimsuit and my singlet on. And then I wanna make sure they'll give you a number. And sometimes they'll say you can don't wear it in the water because the number starts to, starts to disintegrate. But if you want to be really fast, and they allow you to put your number under your wetsuit, then put it on. Put it on a race belt, and then it just makes it faster. Just a time savings uh, in transition. If you don't care about time, leave your number by your bike. The another, the next line is I want to make sure my body is numbered with a marker. So say if I'm number 49, what someone will do, uh, for most races, probably I'd say 75% of the races, most times they take out a big marker and they'll body mark you. And so they'll put numbers on your arm and the number will be your race number. So say I'm 49, put it on. And they usually put it on your arms and then they put it on your calf. And oftentimes they'll put you in your race category too. So we're racing in age groups, so usually it's five or 10 10 year increments and they'll give you a letter you know from A up to I don't know P or something depending on which category you're in so that when you're racing and you're running along or biking along you see someone in front of you and they have that same letter on their calf you know they're in your same category sometimes that gives you extra motivation to to push a little harder so that's what body marking is all about my next line that I check is uh, lubricate my body and outside of the wetsuit so sometimes when you're, when you're swimming uh, with a wetsuit on, you're going to chafe. And so some, t some places, uh, common places to chafe are around the neck. So you can get some uh, body lube. Most triathlon stores or swim stores will sell it. Put it around your neck, especially the back. From what happens is when people are sighting. So you're, 
if you're in a lake or the ocean, you always have to look up to see where you're going. And sometimes what that does is it rubs the back of your of your wetsuit, the tag. And I've seen people just get their whole their back just really, really raw sore. So make sure that your your zipper is done up well and lubricate the back so that it's 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 a little bit uh, won't rub. I'll also put lubricant on my legs and arms of the wetsuit. So say if I have my wetsuit on, I've got a full sleeve or full body wetsuit now. So just imagine that. And I'll come down to my arms. So I'll lubricate the outside of the wetsuit here and the outside down here. The reason why I do that is because when you take your wetsuit off, it goes inside out and it will help uh, just come off that much faster faster off the arms and then faster off the legs. A lot of times you'll see people when they take their wetsuit off, it gets stuck around their ankles. So by having a little bit of lubricant, make sure it's okay to put on your wetsuit. If you have lubricant on the outside of your wetsuit when it flips inside out, then it's, it's going to go. Now my camera is, is beeping at me. and It's not beeping at me, but it's telling me that I don't have any space left. So what I'm going to do is I'll probably have to switch it over uh, or delete something, and I'll, I'll come right back to this. So just just stay right there. Okay, I'm back, and I've switched it over to the internal memory of the camera. So now I should have some space left, and hopefully we can get this done in just a few more minutes. Okay, so what we're doing is we're just going through the transition checklist of the things to do when you get to your race. And so we've just covered uh, lubricating your body, so your body and actually uh, the outside of your wetsuit, and other areas uh, that people will chafe, uh, armpits, armpits, try whatever you're going to race in. Since sometimes people buy brand new race gear and they never try it until race day, which is, which is a big, big mistake because you don't know which spots are going to be hot spots and, ca and cause chafing on your body. So sometimes I get it right here. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll lubricate uh, right here so that it won't, the friction won't be as bad. Um, but if you don't know that you have a hot spot there at the end of the race, if your late race is long, you could be re you could be really sore. Some guys, uh, their nipples chafe, and so I've seen people put band aids on their nipples, and so that they're not going to be bleeding. You don't want to finish the race with uh, uh, bloody nipples. That's pretty painful as well. The other thing you can do is you can actually chafe uh, in the groin area. So with your bike. What you can do is, I don't have a sample here, but you can use chamois cream. You guys ever heard of chamois cream? Chamois cream is, you take uh, some cream, the chamois cream, and you buy it at a bike store or a triathlon store. I think mine's called butt butter. It's kind of a funny name for it, but it, it, it works. It does the trick really well. What you do is you take this butt butter or chamois cream, and you put it on the inside of your chamois, of your, of your tri shorts. And what it does, it just gives some lubricant, um, a, on the shorts so that when you're biking, the rubbing and the friction is not going to cause uh, chafing. And so, again, the longer the race, the more you're going to need that. Like if you're doing a sprint, you may not need that, but if you're doing a longer race, I highly recommend using some kind of a butt butter or ch a chamois cream. Okay, um, the next thing for the swim component is I, I need to take my goggles and my swim cap with me. So I, I know that I have my my, my swimsuit on, I'm going to have my wetsuit on, I'm going to have my timing chip on, and then I take my goggles and my swim cap. And I have listed here, I want to have my goggles anti-fogged. I'm not sure if what you guys do about this, but when I'm swimming, my goggles are always fogging up and it drives me nuts. So I, I like to see where I'm going. There's a lot of tips you can do to keep your goggles from fogging up. One that a lot of people do is they just spit in it. Some people use shampoo, just a tiny bit of shampoo. And what I usually do is I buy a little bottle of anti-fog that I buy at, a, at a, a swim store. And I just put some drops in before, I dip it in the water, and that usually lasts uh, throughout the swim. So that's good. But I want to make sure that my goggles are anti-fogged. Uh, the last thing here is my timing chip is on, on the leg in the correct position. And it does matter which leg it goes on. Typically, you want to put it on the left leg because it stays away from the chain. If you think about your bike, the whole drive, the whole drive train of your bike <coughs> is on the right side. And if your strap is on the right side, you just want to keep it away from the uh, chain, just in case if it, well, the strap opens up 
or something like that. So always keep that strap, the timing chip on the left, uh, left leg. I like to keep my car keys in a safe place. If I've got a buddy or a friend or family member in a race watching me in the race, I would give them my keys. So you need to figure out what are you going to do with your keys. <clears throat> Most people just leave them in their bag. Okay. So that's the checklist for the swim. <clears throat> so then I'll go out and do the swim. But before I do that, let's go on to the, the other components of the checklist. I'm going to come to the bike right away and I'm going to walk you through it because it's kind of nice to have a visual for the bike. <clears throat> but let's go to the run. The run is very simple. I only have four things to do. So I've got my bike in transition in the parking lot, right, in the correct spot. I'm going to have a bright towel on the ground, like ugly towel. Don't bring your favorite towel to the race. You actually don't really use the towel. Uh, the only reason why I put the towel down is, um, I think, because I started off years ago and everyone had a towel. But, and I thought I'd have to towel off, but you actually don't towel off. You just come to, the, come to your bike, start putting things on, and you're going to drip dry pretty quick. But I like the reason why I like to have a bright, ugly towel on the ground is so that I can find my spot. So my, my bike here is custom painted so I can see it. But depending on if I'm using a different bike and everyone else has the same bike, it's like, which is my bike? And so I, if I can find my ugly, bright towel, I go, well, that's, my, that's my spot. And I've done races where there's 3,000 people in a race and you need to f somehow identify your area pretty fast. So use an ugly towel. Ugly bright towel, one that you really don't care about. So I got my towel down. I'm going to put my running shoes on the towel. I'm going to make sure that if I got my shoes, I'll give you an example here. <clears throat> okay, say if I'm racing in these shoes, these are the Newton MV, MV Square. So I'm going to take these shoes, I'm going to put them on the ground, okay? And so that they're going to be ready for me when I come to transition after the bike. So you don't want them tied up, because if they're tied up, then you have to untie them. So you want to make sure they're untied. What I usually do is I take the tongue and I pull it forward. So that's going to be easy for me to put my foot in. I can keep the tongue out like that. So then there's a nice big hole for me to put my foot in. And what you can also do is you can have lace locks. So you know the little locking mechanisms we have for jackets or backpacks or stuff like that. If you don't want them on your jacket, take them off. You can even buy them at a running store for like two bucks. And what you do is you can put them on your laces like this. And it will lock them in place. And so that when you put your foot in, put the tongue correctly, then you just take your lace lock and you pull it down. So there's no tying your shoe involved, which is, which is awesome. You know, uh, I'm doing my race uh, in a week week on Sunday and I remember a note I made to myself last year, Todd, remember to bring the lace locks because you hate tying shoes. And lot, sometimes if you're running in a race, the shoe laces untie. So I like lace locks a lot. Okay. The other thing I'll do too with the shoes is I've got them untied. I've got the tongue out. I'll take and shake them. Sometimes if you're walking around pre-race, you might get some little stones or things in them. Make sure there's no stones in them so that when you put your foot in, it's good to go. Also, if you're running, say if you got off the bike and you step on some, some gravel or whatever, just do a quick a wipe with your feet to get rid of the sand or the, or the little stones before you put your foot in the shoe. Now, sometimes I'll wear socks and sometimes I won't, and that's totally personal preference. And so it's up to you um, if you want to do that. But make sure you know that if you're running without socks that you won't get blisters. Because if you're running with, without socks and you get blisters, that's going to stop you and it's painful. So if I'm doing a, a race that's 10K or under, I won't wear socks. But if I'm going over 10K, I'm totally taking the time to put the socks on. Okay, I'll have a, a hat as well. So I'll put, a, I'll put a hat on the ground so that if I get off the bike, I'll put on my shoes, maybe some socks, and my hat on top. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over the bike checklist. I'm going to bring my bike over here, and then I'm going to walk you through it and how we get the bike ready to go. So just give me a moment to get the bike ready. Okay, so now I've got my bike here, and I'm going to pretend 
I'm at the triathlon and my bike is already racked, okay? Uh, depends on what kind of rack is at the, at the transition. You might be racking it from the front, you might be racking it from the rear. But right now I just have it on a bike trainer and we're gonna go from there. So again, I'm gonna pull out my trusty list and let's go through the list together, okay? What I'm gonna do, let me just bring down the camera so you can see the bike a little bit better. Okay, now this looks better. So now let's go back to the transition checklist. Let's start off with the bike, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna pump my tires to 120 PSI. PSI is pounds per square inch. And most tires are gonna tell you what the maximum pressure you can have on the tires. And it's written on the side of, of the tire here. So you just have to go in and read what it is. The harder your tires, the faster you're gonna ride and the harder the tires, the, the less comfortable the ride is going to be. You're going to feel every bump, but you're going to go faster. The computer is on the bike, and it's working and zeroed. So do I have my computer here? Nope. But if I did have my computer, what I would do is I would take it, put it on the top here, and I would zero it. What does that mean, zero? Say if I, did, say if I biked from my house to the triathlon, and my computer keeps going. And so I want to know at the end of the race what was my time and how far I went and blah, blah, blah. And so if, you're, if your computer is not zeroed, then you'll have the data from your ride before. So make sure you zero your computer, make sure it's fully charged and it's good to go. Lots of times I have people doing a race, I go, well, what, what was your data at the end? They go, I don't know, my, my computer wasn't charged. And to me, I think that's, uh, that's too bad. Take the extra time to make sure your computer is charged and zeroed and will help you when you're racing. Next one, uh, put your bike in a moderate to easy gear. Okay, so if you look down here, we got chain rings on the front. We got a big chain ring and a small chain ring. So if I would recommend, if you're starting off with a small climb, you're in the small chain ring in the front. If it's gonna be really flat, then you can go big chain ring in the front, but make sure that you're in the middle, cock set in the back, which will give you middle, middle or moderate gear rather than the small cog set in the back. The small gear here is actually your biggest gear. So you would not want to be starting a triathlon in your big ring in the front and your, your small cog in the back because that's your biggest gear on the bike. And it happens all the time. If you ever want to see uh, some tragic moments in triathlon, go to the, the mount or the dismount line of a triathlon and watch people getting on and off their bike. And it, it's, for me, sometimes it's very painful to watch that. And some of those falls that people make can be uh, prevented simply by being in the correct gear when you get on the bike. So you don't want to be in too easy so when you get on you're spinning very easy. You don't want to be too hard either when you, put your, when you first get on your bike and then you start to pedal and it's so hard because you can't do it, people sometimes tip over and fall over. So make sure you're in an easy to moderate gear. Uh, just So make sure when you leave your bike and transition, it's in an easy to moderate gear. Okay, next one is water bottles are on your bike. So where, where are you gonna hold your water bottles? You can either put them here on the down tube, you can put them up top, or you can put them behind the, behind the saddle. Most people put them here and make sure that you don't forget them. I've had people in races and they just forget the water bottles at home or they just forgot to bring them. And if that happens to you, don't freak out. Just ask someone, hey, do you have any extra water bottles I can use? And they might have a Gatorade that you can take. And lots of times at races, people are very supportive. So don't, don't worry if you forgot something. Just ask around and chances are you'll get it. I've even seen people get, uh, use other people's shoes, use other people's wheels. Uh, people forget lots of things at triathlon, so just ask around and uh, people will help you. Repair kit is on your bike. So where's my repair kit? Hang on. Okay, this is my repair kit. What it is is just a small bag and inside it I'm going to have a tube, I'm going to have tire levers, I'm going to have some tools, I'm going to have some CO2 so that I can change my tire if I need to. And so this bag goes right behind here, kind of like this, so that if I ever do get a flat tire, I'm going to be able to change it myself. And if you don't know how to change a tire, that's a skill that you need to learn how to do. Okay, so I'm going to check that off. The repair kit's going to be on the bike. And then the next option is, what are you going to do with your bike shoes? So you can either have your bike shoes on the bike or beside the bike. If you leave, now if you look at the, the bike here, I don't have pedals, but just imagine I did. 
if you are a very competent biker and you know your confident level is very high uh, what you can do is you can take your shoes these are my bike shoes and you can have them clipped on to your shoe onto your pedals and you can leave them on and so this is the fastest way to do a transition by leaving them on but make sure that if you're doing just make sure that the race allows that some races will not allow you to have your shoes clipped on because it's very dangerous and I only recommend you to do this if you're very experienced and you practice it a lot of times because I have seen people at races and they try it and again if you go to the, the mountain line so when you have to get onto the bike uh, people are falling over lots of times because it, it looks to me like they're trying this skill for the first time in a race and it doesn't go very well and they fall over so this is an advanced skill if you're going to do that typically you just take your shoes and leave them on the side of the bike and again just like I did with uh, the running shoes I will take the strap and keep them open okay and then I will shake them too so make sure that there isn't any uh, any gravel or inside and so typically when I'm biking I never use socks well if the race is cold I might put socks on but as I get older I'm not doing any cold races so I like to do warmer races now so I won't wear socks uh, when I'm biking so I won't be put socks on but if you find that you need to put socks on then take the time put the sock on and then put your foot in and you can take the sock and put the sock inside the shoe if you want and that's just a way to keep it out of the way okay next thing on the checklist is helmet on the bike so I'm gonna get my helmet I'll be right back okay so this is my helmet and so I got a little trick that I like to do what I do is I put the helmet on right so I'm that transition I put it on and make sure the strap is not done up you don't want the strap done up and then you take it like this and you take it off and then you put it on the bike like this right so if it's on your head and then take it off so that when you come to the bike and you pick up your helmet then you can put it on the correct orientation if you put it on backwards then you're going to have your helmet on backwards and you go why doesn't this fit so just just uh, make sure it's in the right orientation and you can put it on if you don't have arrow bars you can just you can even just have it hanging down on your handlebars like this if you want or you can have it on the ground I'd probably recommend putting it on the ground because if it's on the on your handlebars there's a chance it might get knocked off by someone who's coming in um, and again just keep in the right orientation so that when you come to your bike you just pick it up put it on strap on and away you go and one of the rules of triathlon if you didn't know it but you're not allowed to actually touch your bike or take it with you until your helmet is is fastened up okay and the same thing that when you come off the bike you need to you need to rack your bike before you can unbuckle your helmet it's just a safety just a safety issue so what else I'll also do is I like to bike with sunglasses so I'll take my sunglasses and I'll put them in my helmet so I always like to have my helmet on the arrow bars I go this way I have my helmet put my sunglasses inside and then they're good to go and what else do I got on here? Arm warmers on the bike or your jacket. And again, I might put them in the helmet. Arm warmers are very, they're almost like a spandex thing you put on your arms and just keeps your arm warm. And then uh, it's not like putting on a full jacket, it's just covering up, it's like sleeves. And I like putting, uh, wearing those. Um, if you're doing a longer race, you're going to need some energy. So you need some energy gels or energy bars. And you might have those placed, you might have them taped on your bike. You might have them in a gel flask, you might put them in your helmet so that you can take them and put them in your back pocket before you go. Wherever you're going to do it, you have to decide. But that's, uh, this is what I do. You can kind of see how many different steps are in a transition. And sometimes I lose sleep over this stuff. Like I have triathlon nightmares about, oh my gosh, I went to a triathlon, I forgot a bike, or I forgot my shoes, or I forgot my wheels, crazy stuff. If you haven't, if you haven't had those uh, triathlon nightmares, uh, don't worry, they'll probably be coming. You get more as the race, race approaches. But seriously, I take this transition checklist with me uh, wherever I go, and it doesn't matter what race. Uh, this has been with me for years. And at the top, 
I'm not sure if you can see that, probably not, but I have the, the swim start time, so I'll know what time my wave starts, and the transition close time. So sometimes I say, you have to be out of the transition by this time. So I'll put that down, and, and I'll put down when I have to start my swim. So sometimes you forget, you get excited, or you get kind of nervous. So if I have everything written down, or in a checklist, I'm good to go. So take this with you, take a pen, chick, 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 chick. and then once that's all done, then you can leave transition. You will see people uh, in transition and they just stare there and they're thinking about what they're biking. They're trying to think, do I got everything? And you can just tell, oh my gosh, you just, you, if you had a checklist, you'd be in and out and then you can forget about the bike and you don't have to worry about uh, if you forgot something. So the checklist will definitely save you a lot of uh, time and stress. So that's it guys. Hope you, uh, thank you so much for joining uh, this webinar. If you have any questions, uh, please let me know. You can email me at todd at nolimitstriathlon.com. And with that, I hope you guys have a wonderful week and happy training.